thank you. Um, first off, of course, we would like to, to thank the, the organization for having uh, called us here and gave us the opportunity to come here and uh, explain our project, uh, which is called uh, Carnet. It's actually an editorial project that has been going on for several months within the boundaries of the architecture school in Venice. We are, uh, me and Matteo, two young graduates from uh, Venice Architecture School. Uh, so Carnet is the, is the name of the magazine, and uh, from the Land of Unborn Manifestos is kind of the, the title that, that we wanted to give to, for, this very, for this very presentation. Uh, but first we would like to start with some kind of background story of uh, how this project started. So Carnet, Carnet started in the, in the fall of uh, 2017, March of last year from a group of uh, eight architecture students. So you see two of them right now in front of you, there's six more. Uh, and we, we, we found ourselves to be uh, in the border, let's say, between the, the, the ending of the university years uh, and whatever comes next, uh, somehow. Uh, so the, the, the thought of having to deal with, um, uh, with this period of uncertainty led us to the need uh, to investigate the, the, the closest future beyond us in order to have a clearer image of the architecture scenario in, uh, in Europe. This is our uh, landscape that we investigated uh, with the aim to somehow um, fill the gap between students and, and, and architectural practices. Um, and the moment we had this idea, actually, each one of us uh, left Venice for studying and working experiences abroad uh, within, uh, within Europe, actually, spreading in different cities throughout the continent, Barcelona, Brussels, Rotterdam, Madrid, just to name a few, and which represented both personal experiences as well as professional for us. Um, so we, we actually had to develop the, this project living in this condition of being far away from, from one another, from each other. And this condition of distance is uh, represented in this uh, Skype, um, let's say, uh, screenshot uh, of us working on, on the project and discussing. And it's a condition that um, uh, led to a working method exclusively funded on internet communication, of course. Thus, we consider that our project could, ha could have only been possible thanks to today's means of, uh, of communication somehow. Uh, so we wanted to shed light on the architectural scenario in, uh, in Europe, uh, and we chose 15 young architecture offices, uh, specifically born after the economical crisis of 2008, which in our opinion uh, sort of, um, there's a pre and post somehow, uh, which in the words of uh, Alejandro Zerapolo in his essay, well into the 21st century, uh, generated, at least in Europe, a uh, sort of a flat horizon without uh, orientation. And this, this document from Zero Paolo has been uh, an important document for us, uh, but it represented somehow an external, external point of view, already an analysis of uh, what is going on. And uh, we wanted to, to speak directly with, this, with these people somehow, with the protagonist of this new, uh, of this new generation. Um, and this, uh, this condition, this flat horizon without orientation, in our, in our opinion, led to the birth of a new generation of architectural offices, spontaneously drawing new forms of practice. And this was precisely the, the condition that we wanted to, in, to investigate. So somehow practices that are redefining the borders of the discipline, uh, placing themselves uh, outside of the big star system of, of architecture. Here you see the, the list of offices, so we try to uh, gather as, uh, as many countries as possible in our, uh, in our quest somehow. Yes, as we were making so our professional path and uh, experiences on a personal point of view throughout Europe, uh, we decided to investigate uh, uh, the European landscape uh, through a biographical point of view. Uh, hence, because uh, we uh, always thought that personal and professional lives contaminates each other. And we always kept in mind after, uh, after Dick's experience, the, this quotation by Oscar Niemeyer, in which he says, architecture is only a pretext in the way that life really matters and architecture could emerge 
by a consequence of what we do in our life and so putting uh, in, the, in the background our disciplines and in forward our, uh, our life. This is, for example, a drawing given by the interview. Uh, since from the interview that we made to those 15 architects, uh, childhood, adulthood, uh, present and past were indistinctly present, and as well, professional and personal life were on the same level, on the same point of view. Mm -hmm. From this, uh, even the dimension of the atelier physical and conceptual was important for those offices since it, it could tell a lot about their life. And like in this photo by Luigi Ghirri, uh, that seems like a domestic space, but in fact is a workspace. And the dimension of atelier has been really important, essential for describing the life and the discipline uh, brought by those architects. This is the project, actually. Uh, we decided to create a schedule, uh, a folding paper for each architect. Um, all the architects had the same interview. Uh, the, there were actually six uh, questions about um, biographical, so personal questions, in the way that architecture could demand, again, uh, from an indirect point of view, and included uh, um, a request of a drawing or an image about their uh, working space. This is an Italian uh, from Roma, an Italian studio. Those are the, um, all the offices of the offices schedules. They decided to deliver it weekly uh, in the Central Library of the University of Venice. Since always we believe that the students' community of our university was initially the uh, main uh, audience of our project, also because we wanted to uh, put in a closer relationship the professional uh, atmosphere of Europe with the students' community where, from where we come, actually. Those are so the other side. The of other the side. Project. And this is the final carnet that you will find even outside in the exhibition. Exactly. exactly. So, yeah, we, we decided to call the, this project Carnet, um, as it represents a sort of fictional journey throughout Europe, where to keep uh, written and, uh, and, and drawn fragments, it's, I have it here. Uh, so sort of like a Carnet de Voyage that Le Corbusier was uh, keeping in his pocket. Um, and um, let's say that the, the, the personal interviews that we, that we have made uh, in, in, in this stage of the project have traced multiple trajectories. And this has somehow permitted uh, to deduct that the contemporary European architecture scenario shows uh, an heterogeneous and metamorphic appearance. Uh, but uh, despite this uh, heterogeneity, the, the, the chosen offices for, for, uh, for the project underline some common behaviors that reflect, uh, in our opinion, the economic and political displacement of the contemporaneity. So inventing new forms of, of practice and developing new ways of representation, of course, and they, they all somehow strive to shift the, the professional figure uh, of the architect. And we are now going to, to show you some pieces of interviews that, in our opinion, uh, reflect this condition of contemporaneity. Uh, it's going to be some, some kind of collage of in, pieces of interviews and, and working spaces just to demonstrate how uh, something that maybe one office is, is, is speaking about, the other office is, is drawing it somehow. Um, and we, we, we wanted to, to, to start with this, with this quote from Bonel Doriga, which is this office in, uh, in Barcelona. Uh, as a sort of, um, let's say, base upon which uh, build the, the, the whole presentation. And as I said, as I said before, the, these offices share one common condition, uh, synthesized here, uh, of finding themselves to be oper operating within the context of the European socioeconomical crisis. Uh, and this is actually the, the, the one generation who has experienced the, the, the transition uh, in first person. Uh, they are telling us uh, how they, they began their studies of architecture uh, in the glittery years of the architecture and then they finished them in the middle of, of the crisis. 
Uh, and within, within this context, uh, young offices, uh, in our opinion, are struggling to establish a solid economical position somehow. Uh, you, you often work more for passion than for money, that's what they are telling us at least. So the, this, this kind of thought of precarity, precar a precarious existence, lacking of uh, certainties and job security, and this, in our opinion, has led to a general opening up of the, of the discipline on, on two fronts. Uh, let's say on, on the internal front, uh, within the architectural boundaries, some of these offices have experienced the necessity to economically sustain the, the, their offices in different ways. So simply running the, the office is not enough anymore. And teaching, doing architectural visualization, and even working for bigger offices, uh, from time to time, uh, these architects are forced to, to tackle the discipline on the full spectrum, uh, of course, influencing personal life. And, and I think this, this uh, quote from Unula Uno from Bucharest it pretty sums up the, the discourse for us. So it becomes sort of an, uh, an existential condition. Uh, but on the external front of, the, of architecture of the discipline, some of these architects uh, are not afraid to open up architecture to the contaminations uh, with other disciplines and, uh, and, in the, and, and individuals. So artists, photographers, graphics, mu musicians, and they, they all go together uh, in the mutual exchange of skills and creating a constructive network as La Machina Studio is from, Ro from Rome is telling us here that their office is located within a creative hub and um, Somehow they, they try to even search for, for clients through, through, through friends. Um, and this could, could help uh, from the economical standpoint, of course. Um, and this is actually the, the, the beautiful model, uh, which became an image that La Machina Studio sent us from Rome of their working space. Uh, so this dimension of the atelier comes back. And on the other side, though, uh, the small dimensions of these, uh, of these offices and the post-crisis uh, environment have led also to a sort of figure of the ordinary archi architect. Um, some of these offices refuse theoretical discourse in favor of a rediscovery, even of a more practical approach. Uh, through self-building, for instance. This is what uh, Niklas van Elsa from Berlin is telling us. Uh, to get the, their hands dirty after the, uh, the academic years. And they, in, in their carnet, they told the, the story about this uh, self-built garage right after the, the university years. They just went in the countryside and then they, they built this, uh, this garage for themselves. Um, and th this kind of ordinarity also um, is also reflected somehow in the architecture that some of these offices are interested in. Uh, Schneider Tuster is telling us from Zurich how they are more uh, shaped by ordinary, ordinary and everyday places rather than the important ones. Um, and so much that uh, Unula Uno from uh, Bucharest uh, sent us this beautiful image of their working space. Uh, not even within the boundaries of a room within a building, but uh, as something that is always changing, uh, rearranging, and adapting on the set of the uh, of the urban landscape, made of again ordinary places, situations, and people. So you see sidewalks, street corners, and even cats. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if uh, if some of these practices still have a physical uh, space that they can call our office or their office. Some other are bound together uh, only thanks to the contemporary uh, means of communication, just like us trying to develop this project, ironically enough, so that the working space expands, expands in its totality to, to, to the virtual sphere. This, is, uh, this condition is beautifully, beautifully explained by Fosbury Architecture, based, in, based not even based in Milan, because they are split between Milan and Rotterdam, actually. Two guys from Fosbury work at OMA, I think. Uh, and again, this quote by uh, uh, Fosbury is actually mirrored in the, in the drawing that OM, OMMX uh, sent us from, from London. Uh, you can see there's a little Skype call uh, on the left, uh, on the right corner there. Um, to you.
we, we kept describing the teams for, again from images. And from this image by Pan Supreme, uh, we, we discovered that we, it was important to speak about the relationship with history that those uh, practices had in using the references in architecture for the project and so on. It, what, what, what emerged at the beginning, it was the, um, this condition was in some ways similar, it, it shares similar aspects with the one in which postmodern architects found themselves in the 80s. And this, for us, it was quite funny, quite in interesting, because uh, this condition is beautifully explained in this image, since uh, we have um, the gallery of Cornelis van der Geest with uh, downside the workstation of Wine Supreme. From here, it is important, uh, and we discover for this, uh, again, uh, quotation by Fosbury, that there are too many differences, uh, at least one, the, the principle between the postmodern architects and the contemporary, the one that we have interviewed, and is the one that we have no more fathers to kill. Postmodern architects had a well-known enemy, which is the modernism. They had a defined context of rules, dogma. They have something to reject, betray, to, they had a corpse uh, to playfully practice their autopsy. This is, uh, according to Fosbury, uh, is what we believe. There, there are no more fighters to kill. As we enter it in a post-ideological scenario, is the one of the contemporary one. Boundaries are get blurred. Manifestos and big collectives decay. Together with utopias and ideologies, fathers are no more to be killed or to be murdered. They are set aside, sometimes in a well-closed box, sometimes in a folder to visit occasionally. This condition turns into a singular behavior in relation to history that could be easily described from their approach with the architectural references. In fact, we used references with the Carnet project as a key to understand how they move throughout history. And it, it, under this point of view, uh, references for us as a, are a critical approach to the generation that we interview, since we specifically put a question inside the interview for this. So we, you will see uh, this, this modification through the different practices. Um, false mirror in this quotation tell us uh, how temporal hierarchies decay in using, in fact, this um, quotation. Past and present architectural references are put on the same line. There is no more difference between past and present. They have been used indistinctively. And uh, um, images and history uh, basically becomes an open archive without distinction. And uh, this is uh, put in a landscape where offices pick up fragments and recollect them in new frameworks. They create collage, conceptual and physical, uh, reassembling images, decontextualizing them, and uh, putting uh, in uh, a new context creating new image, images and imaginaries. And we believe that is actually a typical postmodern approach. So this uh, quotation was quite interesting for us. And, and what is really interesting as well is that images and drawings comes back to become an object with a value. They are no more an object, uh, a tool, uh, linked to the sine qua non need to build what you have drawn. So um, it, it comes a good effort. Uh, Postmodern aesthetics comes back from the past, something new, something past, got mixed and blurred together, as I already said. And uh, this is clearly also made possible by the possibility of having an instantaneous access to uh, an immense, an infinite image bank, which is Google, which is internet. And this is typical of the time in which we live and in which the interview architects live. And this is, this is uh, essential for us, also because the images have something, uh, um, have something autonomous. Uh, drawings have uh, their own autonomy. This is another important 
quotation that uh, keeps forward this concept and puts in a um, team that we call sacrum, non-sacrum. This creation is really important uh, in the contemporary times and it was important as well in, uh, in the postmodern times. But going deeper, um, the, the, this relationship with the past is unprecedented if compared with the, with the postmodern times. Because uh, if we think that uh, the battle of postmodernism was specifically on archetypes, because in fact there, there was the modernism back as a background to kill, Nowadays, without having a known enemy, uh, the boundaries of what we are dealing with has, has blurred, has decayed. And so the references becomes a, a global, uh, becomes a, a total, and there is no more distinction between the noble references and the vulgar ones, or the serious and the foolish. Um, what, what is really important is that the all fields of human production becomes material for the project and for discussing and for the theories and so on. Literally, everything could be conveyed within a project. And irony uh, becomes a great part of the game as well, which is important. And this is quite clear in the image of Fala, where everything becomes an auto autonomous object uh, floating on the, on table, the table, on the white table. Yeah. Um, going deeper again, uh, we have uh, uh, we we have assisted to the born of new creative processes because since we have deal with uh, um, uh, with 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 an infinite catalog, and since we have uh, full access for those images, uh, we arrive to have some kind of surreali surrealistic practices in uh, putting the creation of some images. And the reason behind this cadaver esquisse ex take origin as well from the contemporary condition of the practice and from the architect's need and desire, in this case, to place themselves on the borderline of multiple disciplines, generating the multitasking typical of these practices. Again, multidisciplinarity is, is an important uh, concept that is stable in all the 15 interviews that we have made. And the lack of this specific battle, again, gained and developed this typical postmodern desecrating behavior towards the rigid orthodox modernism. Within this generation appears way too more enhanced. And concluding, we could probably uh, say that everything that we have told you today just reflects the condition of contemporaneity. Uh, this is well explained in false mirror offices, which the, the enhancing of the concept that I really told arrives to the image that uh, they produce for us. This is no more an office. They said in the interview before that Disneyland sums them all the cities that they have seen before. This is also tell us that we, in some ways, com comes from a common village, a common background of knowledge in which we could realize, even if we had different experiences. Again, in concluding, always first mirror, tell us the title, finally, of what we have uh, discussed today. Uh, during this conference, and uh, uh, precarity, multidisciplinarity, ordinarity, and uh, this new relationship with histories is all uh, inside this condition of contemporaneity that we have discovered. We especially like this quote by False Mirror, uh, when in our opinion sums up the discourse with the definition draft of unborn manifestos. Since the, once the discipline has been opened up and history becomes all valid, it might be impossible to synthesize an architecture through a unificatory theory, an opened up history and a manifesto. It might be uh, not be ever needed. It might be not necessary, and maybe people wouldn't never be desired to create new manifestos from this point of view. Yeah, if you... Um like what we have talked about right now, uh, we will actually speak with the, with the offices next week in Venice. 
uh, in the scenario of the opening of the of the Biennale, we will speak uh, with the offices in three different days, three different evenings. We will have all of them coming uh, to Venice, uh, to the library, and uh, see you there, if you'll be there. Thanks. At least you could distrust uh, us. Just distrust. But I think I think it's more uh, uh, I think it's more closer to our times. Maybe uh, there is no uh, clear oppositions. Yeah. Uh, like like um, uh, we I, we I all. Agree, I agree with you, but I wonder if there's no clear opposition. Then do you think like in five years, ten years, there will be an opposition to the no clear opposition? With, I, 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 uh, I think there is not a clear uh, answer to your question, but I, I could answer, maybe, that, uh, that there, um, we have seen it. There are multiple, multiple trajectories. Still today, a kind of activism exists. So uh, the opposition uh, still exists sometimes, but is no more uh, conveyed in a singular line, and history as well is no more a linear line. We're not talking about avant-garde. Um, uh, distrust is a, is a verb that François Lyotard used in the condition of postmodernity, and it's important for this because it's not an opposition. It's not a, an ideology. It's just a not believing no longer in what. That, that's the point. So if you want, you could you could distrust I, I, us. I guess maybe if there's you know no no opposition, I wonder if, or no clear opposition. I, I I feel like that that's going to lead to a lot of opposition. But maybe instead of one kind of force, it's going to be multiple forces. Probably right. If there's multiple that's forces, true. anyways, of anything. If seemingly anything goes right, then also anything can be opposed. Ah. Uh, well, it might be, of course, yeah. yes. <laughs> it's open. It's open. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Is there, of course, a big a limit? Uh, uh, because you don't go back to historic uh, architectural styles, you don't build in. in, 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 in Venetian uh, uh, palace from the 14th century or something like this, and there, there is, a, is a limit, there is a frontier of uh, fantasy, and, and it is uh, it is the, it's a clear uh, is the microphone line between, between the, I, Could you speak a bit louder? Yeah, sorry. Uh, could you say that there, there is an opposition? There, there is there is something uh, which is there's a line there's a, there's, a, there's a line between traditional traditional styles. And and a 20th century uh, starting uh, situation, and, and since then, and, and everything in the, in the area, in the, in the room, since then, the space uh, that that uh, developed since then, this this time, would you say this? Um, <laughs> no. Well, I I think that is uh, uh, this border that you're talking about is less shaped than uh, during the postmodernism. I think that. For example, in the Fosbury image, this is clearly remains to uh, the uh, Federico da Montefeltro uh, studio, because it was uh, only wooden, and we inside this kind of drawings on the wood, and this is quite a typical reference to the uh, a Renaissance past that is traditional, as you say. I, I don't know if I answered to the question. Yeah, but you don't, you don't uh, play ideas with, with, with um, you don't gamble with, with these times. Uh, you, don't, you don't play with these times. Uh, 
you, you just have use them as a background, but you, 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 you don't include them uh, for, for figures, for, for architecture, for creating buildings or inner rooms or something, because it's, I think it's, 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 it's a big friendship between this and, 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 and everything that, that uh, created, uh, every created space uh, from since the beginning of the 20th century or something. Mm -hmm. well, um, we could say that generally, uh, of course, they of course they come from uh, a contemporary education, and the, in fact, you you could see from the visualization they use, uh, we could understand from what what they studied, from what they draw, and what they see. Of course, uh, they are what they see, and uh, what they collect. Actually, but uh, some of them even even follow other paths, uh, follow something uh, going deeper uh, with the references and taking even from fig other figurative uh, concepts. So uh, I, I think I think they they collect quite indistinctively past and present, as as they themselves said. Uh, that, that that is what we discovered, but. I think it's like this. One last question, maybe, before uh, the coffee break. <laughs> maybe a reflection on Andrew's uh, question, uh, but to who will kill these architects and who will the uh, counterpart of this movement and what will be? I think if you, if you think about Tafuri and the architecture in Utopia, it, it already happened. But, but when Andrew, you uh, presented your works, I was thinking about Tafuri's uh, text on uh, how, how he criticized architecture. And I think the problem is with this kind of movement that it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a kind of bourgeois approach, let's say. So it's completely avoid any uh, <laughs> proper Marxism or a kind of social approach. Uh, on architecture, and that's 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 the problem with that. But it's a very yeah. uh, problematic issue, I think. Who's going to kill these architects? Probably, uh, as we were saying before, they they're probably going to to kill themselves somehow, <laughs> because because we are talking about architects that, as said before, they are working on small scale uh, projects. So, and Fala is one of them, and. And, and as Andrew was saying before, uh, what happens uh, when they're going to do a, I don't know, a, a museum or a master plan? Are, are they keeping this uh, sort of uh, condition uh, going or what is going to happen? So probably they, they might kill themselves somehow at the end of the day. Thank you very much again for, for the presentation and the answers.